The curtain rises on the most beautiful but puzzling feeling in the world. When it enters our lives, our bodies and senses go berserk. Experts have been examining this wild dance of our hormones. For some time, they have believed that ancient programs are being played out in our heads. Love, desire, and passion, which originate in our brains. And that's where scientists are looking to unravel the secret of love. If two brains are different anatomically, they also think differently. We've evolved all kinds of brain mechanisms and, and hormones um, in order to uh, help us along this arduous, um, complex, uh, dangerous path called sex and love. Women are most unfaithful around the time of ovulation. Some 5,000 years ago, ancient poets write verse about a feeling known to everyone, and although a baffling one, a feeling we all tend to describe in the same words. It is the age of the first love poems, and for the first time, people are writing down what no one can really explain. Charm, beauty, and hearts on fire inspire artists. Frenzied thoughts, jealousy, and pain seek an escape valve in virtuoso written form. From the ancient world to our modern high-tech society, poets and authors write about similar feelings, thoughts, and stories. For love is timeless. For thousands of years, it has described a deep experience which could not be any more human or universal. But poets are still mystified today about why we fall in love, why we suffer, marry, separate, and deceive each other. I fell in love, I kissed, I was favored, I carried the day, I was dearly loved. But who I was, and who she was, and how it happened, is a mystery, known only to the goddess of love. But love is something real, and scientists don't see it like the ancient Greeks. Without love, humanity would not exist. Viennese biologist Karl Grammer is trying to unravel the laws of love. Love is something we feel, and everything we feel has its parallels in our brains, where neurotransmitters must be set off and electric currents must flow. That means love can be grasped, made tangible, and therefore can be analyzed. That's one side to things. The other is that love is not something we invented in the Romantic era. It has always existed, and it is the basis upon which humans can live together. Evolution has developed a program full of contrasts with regard to love. Nature wants to produce as many children as possible. But where does our romantic ideal of a relationship originate? And why is it threatened by untamed sexual desire? Anthropologist Helen Fisher is examining the battle between drives and their natural history. And we're just beginning to realize that romantic love is, is a powerful basic emotion that comes from human evolution, has tremendous chemistry in the brain, and can really destroy you as well as, as save you. Usually, sex is connected with love. Anyone planning to procreate needs a partner from the opposite sex. But why has nature developed two sexes? And why is sex so good that it has accelerated the process of evolution? Single cell units show a huge increase can be accomplished merely by the cell dividing and multiplying without any sexual contact. Each new cell is a perfect copy of the genetic source material. Changes in the inheritance line are rare if no sex is involved. But without sex, the development of a species is dependent on mutation. If a new kind of creature is generated by sexual procreation, the offspring receives a new genetic profile. 
The union of egg and sperm brings about a combination of the inherited material. The advantage? Sexuality accelerates the evolution of species development. With humans, this process has led to significant differences between men and women. To raise their children more effectively, both sexes take on different roles. Recently, scientists have discovered this development is responsible for the lack of understanding between men and women. On average, men and women are very different, and I think they're very different because for millions of years, they did different jobs. I mean, we were designed to put our heads together, to work as a team, but we're very different animals with different talents and different skills, designed to work together to raise um, babies. And of course, the human infant is the most complicated and helpless of all creatures on Earth. It really requires at least one man and one woman to, to rear a child. Behind our tough skull is our brain, the control center of our bodies. Over a period of many evolutionary years, amazing differences have developed between men and women. Latest research on people's brains is producing amazing results. While men use only the left side of the brain for intensive speech tests, women work with both sides. The two brain hemispheres are linked by the so-called corpus callosum, it is significantly broader in women than in men. Scientists believe women can make better use of both halves of their brains because this central bridge is much bigger. Their thoughts link up more resources in the brain and are more flexible, but the male thinking process requires less energy. The center of human drives and desires, the hypothalamus, is smaller in women than in men. The cell agglomeration is not only greater in men, it's also active more often. As a whole, the female brain is smaller, but that's not a disadvantage compared to men. Women make better use of the space between their ears. Because it has the same number of cells, their brains are more compact than men's thinking caps. Men and women both desire sex to an equal degree, but the relationship to physical desire seems to be more complex in women than men. In a test at the University of Vienna, women voluntarily watch sex films. When the hormonal response in these human guinea pigs is compared to their subjective perception, amazing results emerge. From saliva samples, we have been able to determine hormones and have identified testosterone, the most important male sexual hormone, and estrogen. And we have established that the testosterone level in both men and women rises very quickly and to a great degree. And the interesting thing about this was that it rises at the same speed in men and women, and percentage-wise it remains at the same high level. That means for us that men and women physiologically react in the same way. I think if women say today that the film was unpleasant or awful, that reflects the interesting thing in the biological female strategy, that women can physiologically be roused very quickly, but psychologically they don't react so quickly. That means they have pushed another filter in between. They can decide whether they will pursue the man in question or not and ask whether it is opportune or not. That doesn't mean that one brain is better than the other in any way. Both of them have specialized in different areas of life through the millennia. As part of their inheritance from ancient, perilous times, men generally find their way better in unknown territory and are better able to take aim. But women are more able to recognize other people's feelings than men. This social intelligence helps them to act with more diplomacy, protecting themselves and their children, and calming overheated male temperaments. The differences between the sexes have arisen because both wanted to procreate. Men and women are not only very different, but in many respects, um, each has been a vast breeding experiment run by the other sex. Um, men are the way they are because women have chosen certain kinds of men and born them children. Those children have um, lived and passed on the traits of those men. For example, men tend to be, on average, a great deal more physically aggressive than women are. While men's brains turn violent more quickly in conflict situations, women usually opt for a different means of defense. There's a great deal of data that now shows that women are, are linguistically more skilled. Little girls speak sooner, with more grammatical accuracy, with more words per utterance. Women are better at um, uh, verbal fluency, at finding the right word rapidly. But all the differences are no reason for stereotyping the roles of the sexes. 
Even today, it's common for people to think stereotypically. But the so-called weaker sex proved at the start of the 20th century that women can do what men do just as well. The opposite is also true. However great our differences may be, our similarities are equally amazing. Emancipation in modern societies is well advanced, but the less fixed the roles of the sexes are, the greater the conflicts in our thinking, as the chemistry in our heads still follows ancient rules. We haven't been uh, civilized for very long. I mean, we have a very old brain and very old emotion centers in the brain and a very modern culture. As a result, we have all kinds of behavior patterns that, are, that come out of the animal world that are not always suited to our modern social world. Eating, loving, and looking after our bodies. Many of the needs in a relationship stem from Stone Age men and don't seem to want to change. As ever, men are always only interested in one thing. And what women want has hardly changed regardless of emancipation. Men and female curves. Men search for curves and curves attract men. But why has the male brain decided to react so clearly to these signals? Of course there are clear sexual signals. Everything linked to these accumulations of fat that show off reproduction is interesting for men. That is to say, breasts and bottoms interest men. If these signals are covered up, the sexual stimulus decreases measurably. Then even men assess a potential partner with a bit more subtlety. Men tend to be attracted to clear skin, bright eyes, swishy hair, a buoyant personality, um, a supple figure, um, the kinds of things that signal youth and fertility. And women around the world still, without even knowing it, tend to try to look uh, fertile and young. Women do appreciate an attractive male body. And in candid moments, they may enjoy a risque glance. But they're much more interested in something quite different in men. Women are attracted to men with power, um, status, education, the kinds of things that for millions of years women would have needed to help them rear their young, a powerful man. And as a result, men spend their lives trying to get ahead in the office. Men are much more willing than women are to um, jeopardize their health, their safety, their spare time, even their family lives in order to get ahead, in order to achieve rank. And one part of the male body is more interesting for women than all the rest. Women tend to look at a man's face because they want to know if he's friendly. That's where they see his emotions. And it's easier to enter a relationship with somebody who's friendly. The evolutionary process that led to man walking upright has given humans many freedoms. Their hands are free, their posture is more variable, and this has given new input to their sexuality. Like us, bonobo monkeys' pelvises are tilted forward. That means they can walk upright, too. It also means that bonobos do not just mate from behind like almost all other animals. They also do it face to face, like humans. We not only share 98% of our genes with these monkeys, an equally strong sexual drive is also very similar. Among zoologists, the bonobos have the reputation of being the most sexually active creatures in the world. They not only love both sexes, but also constantly change their partners, and without any jealousy. At least biologists have not yet found any signs of jealous bonobo behavior. In that sense, humans are quite different. Like humans, gorillas are familiar with the feeling of raging jealousy. Their sexual life is less wild than the bonobos, and female gorillas can easily become cantankerous if the large male starts giving his attention and protection to another female. And the fully grown male gorilla flexes his muscles when a male rival comes near his mate. All the offspring in his clan must stem from him alone. The primate human can be classified somewhere between the gorillas and the bonobos as regards jealousy and free love. Research carried out in 37 different cultures shows that people all over the world have similar desires as regards a partner. Men mostly look for a partner who is sexy but not available for other men. His children naturally must all be his own.
there are some gender differences in what makes a man jealous and what makes a woman jealous. Um, men tend to be wildly jealous when they think that their partner is sleeping with, with somebody else. And there's a Darwinian explanation for this. A man stands, uh, stands to spend his life raising a baby that isn't his. He stands to be cuckolded by a woman. So it is not adaptive for a man to be in love with a woman who is sleeping around. In opinion polls, status and money are important criteria for choosing a partner. Female jealousy scenes back this up. Women become extremely jealous when they feel that their partner is giving their resources to another woman. Women fall in love with a man in part because he's got th some resources and because he's going to share those resources. And when he turns away and starts to give those resources to somebody else, women become extremely threatened and often exceedingly jealous. The shelves of a Munich dating agency. Every single person introduces him or herself by speaking on a cassette. Most of them are attractive and have mastered career and cultural life. They have all they want, except for a partner. Today, there are more singles than ever before. Finding a partner in the modern world has become tougher. The reason? The conflict between our lifestyle and the old biological programs in our heads. Love is up for sale, as it were. Partner choice criteria determine the hunt for Mr. or Miss Wright. The list of demands is firmly lodged in our minds. It's almost always true that a woman wants a man with more money or status than she has. The man desires a beautiful, faithful woman. Men around the world tend to give gifts to their partners, and we see this in all kinds of other animals. For example, um, chimpanzees will, will give a, a male chimpanzee will give a female uh, bananas in exchange for sex. The subtle courting gifts of nature this male insect spoils the lady of his choice. She is choosy and will only mate with him if her lover brings her something to eat. This male bird is trying to impress a female with the riches he has carefully sorted. If his collection of showpieces isn't magnificent enough for her, the female will quite simply give him the cold shoulder. This behavior by animals looking for a partner is similar to the oldest profession in the world. The man wants a beautiful female body. The woman wants the man's means. Biologists attribute this strange drive to evolution. By doing so, the woman accrues wealth to bring up her children to be healthy and safe. The man gets an opportunity to reproduce. Money and procreational success. Studies show that in comparison with others, the wives of rich men have more children who become healthy adults, and rich men have more sex, even if they don't always admit it. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Anthropologists have taken a look at um, adultery in many cultures around the world, and as it turns out, big men in societies do tend to collect more wives and, and more extra lovers. Money clearly makes men sexy, and that hasn't changed even in our largely emancipated society. And what's worse, if you compare women who are good earners with those from poorer countries, it's clear that rich women have even higher expectations regarding their partner's income. Women who are successful normally want their husband to earn more than them, but that makes it hard for them to find a partner there aren't that many richer men in the Western world. In such cases, women need professional help to catch their fairy tale prince with his collection of credit cards. That a woman who is a high earner will not get a man who earns less at our agency is a given. As far as status is concerned, our women always get a man who earns more than they do. Even very rich women in the Western world generally want a man who's even richer. And indeed, um, even if he isn't richer, you'll find a woman who's extremely wealthy pick a man who's a great poet or a great philosopher, as long as he has high status and access to resources. American divorce statistics confirm this financial trend. In the USA, a marriage is most likely to break down if he earns less than her. And in the United States, the women initiate divorce proceedings in up to 60% of all cases.
The Happy End Dating Agency in Munich works using a computer program designed by Professor Grammer. The professional go-betweens use it to evaluate important partnership criteria. It is clear that money and beauty go hand in hand. Alongside the woman's beauty and the man's riches, common interests and liking each other play the main role in successful matches. Because what's the use of a rich partner who shows no understanding? Attractiveness and status are the selective criteria specific to the sexes, but both sexes primarily want someone who is nice and understanding. Your partner must have these qualities if you want a good, long-term, stable relationship. That's why it's the primary criterion for relationships. If two people like each other enough, a man of low status can marry a woman of high status. Relationships that are built on human values are the happiest. People have been fascinated by beauty down through the millennia. It has a magical appeal for us. All over the world, beauty opens people's hearts. And with a bit of luck, one look can open the door to a time of love, desire, and passion. The Greek poet Longus knew all about this. No one ever has, and no one ever will, escape love. Not while there is beauty, and not while eyes can see. But what is beauty? And why do we find one person attractive and another unattractive? Scientists are trying to solve the riddle surrounding beauty. The following test is always carried out. A volunteer looks at pictures of young women. He has to judge the women's beauty solely in line with his own personal tastes. The amazing thing is that the same women are always most popular. Quite independently of each other, the human guinea pigs select the same beauty queen. It even works across cultural boundaries. African candidates find the same Europeans beautiful, and vice versa. Many experiments confirm that symmetry and beauty belong together. Using a special computer program, Professor Grammer measures the symmetry of both halves of the human face. On one face, which is often considered less attractive, the symmetry line is off-center. In beautiful faces, the line is always right down the middle. Does this mean we will be able to predict the winner of beauty contests in the future? English scientists already think so. They say the bodies of people with symmetrical figures are viewed as more beautiful in opinion polls. And American experiments add something to this theory. Symmetrical people are better lovers. According to their results, well-proportioned people give their partners more sexual orgasms than non-symmetrical people. You can find the principle of symmetry in nature from scorpion flies to human beings. Symmetry has something to do with the way an organism is able to cope with interference from its environment during its development. Experts say the more symmetrical a child is, the less he or she has to fight against sickness and parasites. And there's more. It's generally true that an attractive body is accompanied by a pretty face. We have had people assess women from behind, from in front, without seeing her face and her face on its own. It turns out that women's bottoms are related to their faces. The question is, how can this occur? And things get even weirder, because if we put a t-shirt on a woman and let her wear it for days, the good-looking women also smell good. Professor Grammer's team in Vienna conducting an experiment. Different women slept in the same t-shirt for a week. Now, some men have to perform a smell test. Once again, there's a clear favorite. While some of them turn their noses up, none of the men can let go of one t-shirt. Tests carried out with the photos of the women wearing the t-shirts reveal the truth. The woman with the most attractive body smell also has the most beautiful face. The scientists in Vienna 
are sure that any woman blessed with beauty also has many other pleasant sides to her. This means beauty is an all-embracing feature in a person, or attractiveness, or whatever you want to call it. It is hardly ever true that a less attractive face will accompany a good body. That's why biologists say that beauty is a genuine, honest signal, and that attractiveness must have something to do with success in reproduction. Beauty is a sign of good genes. But the biological makeup of women also knows how to trick a man's brain. Special smelling agents are women's secret weapons. Regardless of a man's taste and beauty, once what's known as cupulines reach a man's nose, all of a sudden the lady in question becomes more attractive than before. The male's sense of judgment goes haywire as soon as he smells them. Even if these secret smelling agents are so diluted that they cannot be consciously smelled, the male control center in his head goes wild. Women use these cupulines, which are a form of pheromone, to confuse men's brains and at the exact point where men are at their most sensitive. And that is in their perception of attractiveness. Because that is their only criterion in choosing a partner, and precisely this criterion is attacked. That's why we speak of chemical warfare in this connection. Tiny glands are the heroes in the battle to attract the other sex. They produce the material that confuses the senses. The source of this intimate messenger can be found under the armpits, in the genital area, on a woman's navel and on her forehead. When the sweat glands on the skin open their bulkheads together with what's known as the apocrine glands to the right of the picture, special bacteria start to have a field day. They change these basic materials into an effective body odor. If a partner gets a whiff of this perfume cocktail, his brain immediately makes a decision. Either it increases his interest or leads him to discreet restraint. And there's more. What's known as the verumen nasal organ is widely found among animals and has a great influence on their sexual behavior. Scientists suspect that perfumes travel down a high-speed data highway directly to the brain via this organ, and that it's also relevant in humans. Quite unnoticed, this sense cell analyzes the substance messages and reports back to the brain. Here is a potential partner that fits your genetic profile. Are these the rules that paralyze us when we seek beauty? Although we feel that something is happening, we usually don't know how. What a blessing. The feeling of being aroused is most attractive when it simply happens. Poetry dating back 2,500 years describes the feeling. It's happening again. Golden-haired love musters me to play with the girl with the kaleidoscopic sandals. Before birds mate, a virtuoso courting dance takes place. The female needs to be persuaded. The male has to offer something. This ritual always takes place according to the same patterns with birds. The same kind of choreography of love occurs in humans, but it is not visible to the naked eye. Still, the aim is clear. The exchange of gestures is designed to determine whether the two really want to come together. Modern computer and camera technology expose the movements in the courting process, and this language is more universal than is generally accepted. Not even the camera needs to be hidden for this test. When two people are really interested in each other, the human courting dance will occur one way or the other. When two people have just met, the woman almost always makes typical sexual gestures. She shows off the curves in her body runs her hand through her hair, 
but these gestures can easily be misunderstood. These clear sexual signals are very common at the beginning, but strangely they don't have any significance then. In contrast, male gestures are simple. He spreads himself out. Men also try to attempt to look as relaxed as they can. Women are attracted to a man who leans back, who gestures in a comfortable manner, who shows a sort of a grandeur, a comfortableness with himself. Primates act similarly at this point. If what you see with gorillas is a lot of what's called display behavior, where the males will display towards other animals, both to show interest but also aggression. Men like to present themselves in their best light. Unconsciously, they make use of an ancient repertoire to show off. But in contrast to their relatives in the animal world, they pull out their verbal trump card when courting a woman. They begin to paint a picture of themselves, speak very often in the first person singular, and qualify things very positively. In short, they are saying, I am the greatest. This is really the only script they possess and the only chance of mastering the situation, so to speak. The human courting dance is led by the woman. Tests using computers show that a rhythm is created between her and the man through her subtle, unconscious gestures. But we're not talking about specific movements or gestures. They can be quite varied. The computer measures the speed and intensity of the movements and then establishes a pattern. Each couple finds its own choreography. We know, for example, that there are patterns that people create between each other. Looking at 50 couples, we didn't find a single pattern twice. That means each couple showed off its own pattern, and it is irrelevant what behavior is contained in this pattern. The main thing is that these patterns are rhythmical. Rhythmical patterns have a quite specific function, which is the compatibility test. People are trying to establish whether the other person fits by getting a feel for his or her patterns of movement. It is apparently true that men possess a fixed body rhythm with which they move. And the woman provides the syncopation. That means she incorporates at particular intervals behavior patterns that people don't consciously notice. But for those involved, this dance of gestures runs its course unconsciously. They feel great with each other without knowing why. Love and sex, the one often leads to the other. Whether people first fall in love or find love through sex are two quite different biological programs. Three American scientists at the Emory University in Atlanta are investigating the biochemistry of bonding and sex. They are very interested in the feeling of being passionately in love. First of all, there was the intrusive thoughts. People would talk about constantly being, constantly thinking about this person they had these feelings for. And then, oh yeah, it was possible to think about something else. But when they relaxed, thoughts of this person came into their consciousnesses. And this was not at all an unpleasant experience. There was a desire for reciprocation. People who felt this way about somebody always wanted to know whether their feelings were returned. Being in love is an overwhelming feeling. Nearly everybody knows that. Scientists believe being in love is a program that binds us to another person for the purposes of reproduction. Whether male or female, the feeling is about the same for any person. Our capacity to have these feelings, it's something that has evolved over thousands, perhaps millions of years. And if you think about it, one of the things that limerence involves is the getting of together of people in a romantic fashion. And when that happens, typically all other things being equal, sexual Sexual feelings are, are a common part of this, and where there are sexual feelings, reproduction is more likely. Every aspect of love is directed towards an evolutionary goal, reproduction, which means nature clearly envisages that feeling in love will come to an end. Paradoxically, limerence brings people together reproductively in a, a reproductive unit. 
but later on separates that reproductive unit. So each of the partners may go off to find another reproductive partner with whom they will produce offspring. And that may be one of the other reasons why the potential for feelings of limerence has evolved. Nature also aids in bonding when a person has fiery sexual feelings. It can forge red-hot desires into long-term bondings. Do people become one heart and one soul through sex? Scientists are convinced certain hormones can make it possible. Dr. Jim Winslow is trying to unravel the biochemistry of sexual bonding here in Atlanta. For a prayer of all, mating can uh, sort of persists over about a 12-hour period. The animals come together, they, uh, they get used to each other for, for about an hour or so, and then they begin to copulate, and they copulate uh, vigorously for almost 12 hours straight. Um, and at the end of that, they appear to develop what appears to be the sort of a preferential relationship, a, a bonding of some kind. Winslow is looking for traces of bonding in the blood of mice. A special substance is created during sex. This leads to long-term bondings for many animals after they have mated. Oxytocin and vasopressin, depending on who gets injected, uh, could actually produce the same uh, sort of process in the absence of sexual relationship. So if, for example, we put a male together uh, with a non-sexually active female and injected him with vasopressin and then tested him 24 hours later, he would behave as if he had all the copulatory experiences and had developed uh, this, this pair bond. But not all animals respond to these hormones in their blood with pair bonding. Their brains don't seem to react to these bonding substances in the same way. One glance at nature shows that exclusive couples' relationships are the exception. Most monkeys become more integrated in the community through sex, but don't become bonded to a single sexual partner. This means species which form bonding relationships are something quite special. These are called Kalamika or Gouldy monkeys. They're very closely related to tamarins and marmosets. And one of the unique things about them is that they form monogamous pair bonds for life, one male with one female. And they'll live with an extended family of several generations of infants and offspring. And the male is generally the one who carries the newborn babies. Scientists think human beings long for bonded relationships, despite unfaithfulness. Special places in the brain react strongly to oxytocin. These could be a hidden key to monogamous relationships. When love is physically expressed, this puzzling love substance becomes active in the human body. Women have special sense cells in their breasts, their loins, and their genitals. Men, on the other hand, only have them on their private parts. If these tacital cells are aroused, they pass on a signal to the brain. This sense of arousal reaches the hypothalamus, which controls drives and desires. There, oxytocin is immediately released into the blood. The brain recognizes this signal substance and reacts. Our thoughts are ready for closer bonding, so the experts believe. Oxytocin also encourages milk production. A flood of this hormone is given off at birth and during breastfeeding. Scientists see in this a reason for the bonding between mother and child. They believe love was born through this process. It first begins with mammals. We assume that it was initially a bonding tool between mother and child. This bonding is absolutely necessary, at least for most mammals, so as to be able to successfully raise their offspring. Love is the glue which holds together the mother-child relationship. That is the origin, and we assume that a transfer has taken place to create the love that exists for a partner. Most animals only indulge in sex during a short mating season, but humans do so much more often. Many primates share this sexual flexibility with us humans. Dr. Kim Wallen of the Emory University is analyzing this link between hormones and sexual behavior. In a rat or a guinea pig or a rabbit or a variety of female mammals, 
they simply physically can't mate uh, except when they're fertile. In primates, what's happened is that this hormonal regulation of the capacity to mate, of the ability to mate, has disappeared. And what we've been left with is hormonally modulated, hormonal influences on uh, interest in mating or sexual desire. The female's cycle governs the sexual behavior of many animals. During the rutting season, the womb is ready to conceive and ovulation is about to take place. The sexual organs are open to allow animals to mate. Immediately after the rutting season, the female can no longer copulate. But in humans and many primates, the female sexual organs are always accessible. The woman is therefore always in a position to have sex. During ovulation, the ovaries release a huge amount of the sexual hormone estrogen. The hypothalamus understands that estrogen is the signal for readiness to conceive. Her brain unconsciously responds by desiring sex. Only females have these fluctuations in their desires. Men, on the other hand, are constantly ruled by their hormones. One of the striking differences between males and females is that um, female sexual motivation, as influenced by hormones, occurs cyclically. And so they go through periods where they have increased interest in sex, followed by periods when they are less interested in sex. Because the male endocrine cycle is more or less constant, you find in males you have a, a, a more or less constant interest, interest in sex. But nowadays, both men and women are equally unfaithful. In the past, it was different. Men had affairs much more often than women. In modern society, female sexuality has long since caught up with male activity. Current statistics show women are slightly more likely to have an affair than men. Once again, women's hormonal fluctuations play an important role. Women normally have an affair when they could become pregnant. Women are most unfaithful around the time of ovulation. It seems as if we've been duped by evolution. We seem to have a double reproductive strategy, a tremendous drive to pair up with a partner and also a tendency to cheat. I've looked at adultery in 40 cultures around the world, and everywhere you look, in every single society, even in cultures where you can have your head chopped off for adultery, men and women take that chance and cheat. Ovulation and women's sexual behavior. Biologists are carrying out a study in discotheques in Vienna under the leadership of Professor Karl Grammer. A research worker speaks to a woman who is wearing rather less than others in the club. She is asked to take part in an experiment. In a separate room, a photographer is ready to take pictures of the candidate from the front and behind. These photos are later analyzed by a special computer at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. As a result of their experience, the scientists have developed a particular talent. They can predict how close a woman is to ovulation by how low cut her clothes are. The experts jokingly say that this woman is bound to be about to ovulate. We can link the amount of flesh exposed with the amount of estrogen. It turns out that women who have a higher level of estrogen show off more flesh. A tiny sample of saliva confirms things. The high level of estrogen in this young woman shows ovulation is not far away. We discovered this in discotheques in Vienna. We always found one type of woman who turned up alone, had a long-term partner, didn't take the pill, and at exactly the time of ovulation showed off more flesh than other women. Repeatedly, the laboratory workers fish out new candidates from the crowd. In all, they test far more than a thousand women. Caught up in the dance of hormones, nature unconsciously dictates the beat and the goal. A kind of spontaneous genetic shopping trip. And at the right time, 
This is the only way nature can increase the variance of offspring with genetic profiles much different from a brood of one single male. The trend is also true for women who hardly show off any flesh. Their estrogen level is normally low. They aren't ready to conceive. If you consider that all of this more or less took place at the same temperature, without rain and so on, they are really different. During ovulation, desire is aided by the sense of smell. Male sweat under the arms stinks, normally. Pheromones are responsible for this stink. They often smell pungent. But during ovulation, women should trust their sense of smell. At this time, their brain filters out the unpleasant smells, and an attractive male pheromone becomes dominant. It's the man's genetic calling card that can be smelled. If it appeals to the woman, she may well hit the genetic jackpot and produce good offspring. The turn of the century in the USA. Modern genetic technology is making huge progress and upsets evolutionary theories at one point. If men used to think all their children stemmed from them, it had evolutionary advantages. The children enjoyed a combination of the best possible provision and a good mix of inherited traits. But perhaps one or other of the children wasn't fathered by the husband. Those times are over now in the USA. By means of a simple, cheap, and painless test, anybody can know in a very short time who the father was, if there is any doubt. Usually, I would think the father. Um, occasionally, the mother wants to know. Um, but for the most part, she's the one usually accusing the alleged father and, wants, and has to prove that he is the father. The test doesn't spare anyone, not even the child. All those who are involved are called in, and the truth often isn't very pretty. The youngest we've had, 16 years old, I believe, was the youngest. And actually, he came in here to be tested for the second child. This tiny smear can tear apart whole families. Occasionally, they come in here and they're fighting like cat and dog. But they don't come in here together at all. They'll come at different hours of the day. Some even try to get the staff involved in the dispute. They'll sit down. If the, if the mother's not in there, they get a little confident. and They'll start telling you, I don't believe it. <laughs> I just don't buy it. It's not mine. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> all kinds of stories. But for the genetic laboratory, they're just cell samples with a personal genetic code. It is often a tragic decision for many families. If the husband isn't the father, mother and child must go the way of many fatherless families. The only alternative is to find the real father and, if necessary, sue for child support. The feeling of passion eventually fades away. As people get older, sex with the same partner loses some of its fascination. Divorce rates are high, and if partners stay together, love can get terribly drab. But again and again, couples marry, expecting great joy wherever it might be found. Together, they tie the knot of marriage, and time shows that often it's worth it. Many people long for a loving partner with whom they can grow older. When sex and passion have died down, a different power can bind two people in love. The human psyche finds many ways to long-term happiness, even on a small scale. The social psychologist Dr. Art Aaron from New York and his team of experts are investigating these complex ways of the psychology of love. To get hold of important information, the team develops tests in which human test volunteers are really taken for a ride. If this woman knew what the tests were really about, she would unconsciously try to embellish her answers. She believes the machine in the background is exactly measuring her feelings and comparing them with test results. 
In reality, it's all hogwash that is only designed to ensure the test candidate tells the truth because she believes that in this situation, she cannot lie. In this experiment, the psychologists are investigating which stimuli the feeling of being in love supports most strongly. Visual stimuli and smells are compared with acoustic stimuli. The volunteers respond most strongly when a love poem is read out loud to them, or when they hear the sounds of a love song. But Dr. Aaron is really most interested in how bonding really takes place in our minds. When people suddenly fall in love, there's often a period of great exhilaration, spending a lot of time with each other. They, as we would say, they're including each other in each other's self at a very rapid rate. They're getting to know each other, and that creates a sense of expansion. I not only know who I am, I know who my partner is and how my partner sees the world. That's extraordinarily satisfying, exhilarating, and wonderful. When people have just fallen in love, they would most like to fuse together with their partner. Anyone who's been on cloud nine knows this feeling. The New York experts suspect that when we incorporate our partner into our thinking and our own personality during the time we're in love, we're using the same parts of the brain we use to think of ourselves there seem to be amazing overlaps in our brains. But how do we measure the incorporation of our partner into our own personality? For this purpose, Dr. Aaron has developed a revolutionary test. The test candidates simply indicate a set of two circles that, in their opinion, best describes their feelings of closeness to their partner. And it turns out that the circle they pick, that is how, cl how much overlap there is, uh, predicts all sorts of stuff. It turns out to be a better measure of the sense of closeness than long questionnaires with 50 or 100 questions. It also predicts things like the amount of confusion of self and other on these cognitive tasks and memory tasks. It also predicts whether people will stay together for very long. It predicts, it's associated with their sense of satisfaction in the relationship with how much time they spend together. So it's, it turns out this very simple measure is very basic. At the beginning, the overlap is enormous, but the sense of ecstasy doesn't last long. In the first year or two, there's a big increase in satisfaction. And then at about the time of the birth of the first child, um, there begins to be a decrease. And it tends, on the average, to continue declining at least until the last child leaves home. But both partners are psychologically still strongly bonded to each other. And Dr. Aaron has encouraging results to help couples overcome the hurdle of increasing discontentment. Here, a couple has to run an obstacle course together. It's fun, and the effort makes the adrenaline level rise significantly. Psychological tests after completion of the task show that their sense of contentment in the relationship has increased markedly. What we've suggested is that if, as this begins to slow down, the couple, as a couple, starts taking on exciting, expanding activities, that they'll still have that sense of expansion, and if they do it together, it will be associated with the relationship. But it's quite easy to ruin the fun. Once again, couples receive experimental exercises that should be fun and allow their adrenaline levels to rise. But both of them have no idea that their relationship is being tested. The experts give them the task of deciding whether the man or woman is better with a tennis racket. A battle of the sexes begins. As one partner is almost always better, there is usually a loser, and someone who triumphs at the expense of the other person. 
Envy and frustration are the greatest killjoys. The fun is over. Seldom does a relationship bring even a tiny spark of contentment for either partner in these circumstances. Finally, the experts turn the experiment around. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and do the cooperative task. This time you're working together as a team, and so the total number of targets that you two hit down will, or will just be added together, and that'll be your team score. Um, we'll be comparing your team score with the other scores of other couples. Cool. So, do you have any questions? Your team. We start? No. In this part of the experiment, Team spirit, mutual encouragement, comfort, and common joy largely prevail. Being a team is a human experience that can bring a couple closer together. Who's good at serving tennis balls hardly interests the expert at all. She's simply monitoring the changes in the psychological tests. In this case, they are positive. The quality of the relationship a person is in is more related to one's happiness than any of the other factors in life, uh, maybe with the exception of very serious ill health. Um, but it tends to work more the other way. That is, the general happiness with life affects your happiness with the relationship and your happiness with other areas of life. The experts are convinced that the best thing people can do for their relationship is to ensure that they are happy. It's best if a couple do this together and more and more frequently. The longest lasting relationships are based on a deep friendship and a relationship like this is probably the greatest thing life has to offer. For centuries, certain lovers have sometimes been at a loss. Other couples find eternal happiness with each other. Artists, poets, and scientists spend their whole lives racking their brains about love. For those who spend too much time analyzing love and haven't yet found their own first love, the Roman poet Horace has a good piece of advice. Don't ask what will happen tomorrow whatever the sum of days given to you. Think of it as treasure. And when you are young, never say no to dancing and sweet desire. <laughs>